ready? Let's go. to another amazing edition of Sonya on Air. I am your host, Sonya Hudson Payne, and how do I start off each and every single show? You guessed it. I have another great show for you. Coming up in just a few, a few short moments, I have none other than Mr. Dalman from the legendary, the legendary R&B group, Jodeci. Can you believe it? But I just want you to do me a few quick things, please. Few quick favors. Make sure that you subscribe to all Sonya on Air streaming platforms. You can find Sonya on Air streaming across every major streaming platform. So make sure that you subscribe and also hit the notification button. And I also have amazing merch. So look in the description section and you will find the link to the Sonya on Air Empower merch. I'm very, very excited about this merchandise. Why don't you let your clothing be the statement? Sometimes we're just tired of talking during all of this. So why not walk into a room and let people read what's on your apparel? So head on over to Sign Your Air Merch and find yourself an amazing mug for your coffee or tea in the morning. You know, we love to sip tea. And you can also find your amazing t-shirts and hoodies. And also what I want you to do, there is a company that I wanted to highlight, a black owned brand led by an amazing queen who isn't born to bling. I know I like to bling. If I'm not adorning diamonds, I love nice pieces that can take me from morning, afternoon, evening, and nighttime. So, and $5, $5 jewelry. And every time you purchase a necklace, it comes with matching earrings. Can you believe that? And the material, nickel and lead free. So you won't be breaking out, things like that. You know, people looking at you like, why does she have a rash on her neck? So make sure that you head on over to www.borntoblinkjewelry.com. Once again, that's www.borntoblinkjewelry.com. Amazing pieces. So like I told you in just a few short moments, we have none other than Mr. Dalvin, from the amazing and legendary, I have to say legendary all over again, Mr. Dalvin from the group Jodeci. We're really going to unpack everything about how he became a music legend. And this conversation will definitely help all of you who are interested in pursuing a career in the music industry. It's not easy. And this conversation that we're going to unpack with Mr. Dalvin will let you know about all of the trials and tribulations that led up to where he is today. So we're just waiting for him to join us. I'm sure that he will be here very, very soon. I'm curious, um, how many of you saw the salt and pepper biopic the other night? So we're going to be talking about that later on in the show, but I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. So without any further ado, why don't we unpack the pivotal moments and milestones from none other than Mr. Dalvin from Jodeci. Hi. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing fine. It's such a pleasure having you on Sign Your Air. How are you doing uh, during this pandemic? Yeah, man, it's trying to stay busy, you know, trying to stay focused. It's, it's hard though, but you know, I'm missing being on stage. Yeah. Missing my group, missing just being in the studio, you know, missing the fans, missing everything, you know. I get it. I get it. And I'm so looking forward to this conversation. You are what we consider a legend in the music industry. And there are so many individuals who aspire to be exactly where you are mm -hmm. and maybe even beyond that. So all of these questions, this entire conversation will really help people into the music industry and hopefully become a legend just like you. Are you OK with that? Yeah, I see what I see what you know what happens. Come on, I'm waiting. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm sure you will be. Let me just share a little inspiration from me, a personal story, you okay. know. And now that I have the opportunity to share this with you, I'm going to take the opportunity to do so. Right. I remember being a college student in the 90s, and there was something on television called um, Video Jukebox, I think it was, where you had to, yeah, you had to pay for the video in order to watch it. <laughs> So my college friends came to my parents' place here in Brooklyn, New York, and we waited, no exaggeration, five hours for a Jodeci video really? to come. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> five hours. So when I circled back to my college friends and I told them that you were going to be on today's show, they said you have to tell him about that memory. So that's cool. Yeah, I remember uh, when we first actually moved to New York, the jukebox was there. So we used to like wait for our favorite rappers to come on. And then we wait for like Dougie Fresh videos and Big Daddy K videos and like your video didn't come on to hours, hours, even after you requested it. So yes, yes, uh, they just took our money and made us took wait. Your money. Yeah. <laughs> it made you wait. Yeah, basically. Yeah. That's a good marketing ploy, though. I, 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 I got it. Was. It was definitely. Was. But you know, I want to start from the very beginning. You know, before all of the fame, because people see you along with Jodeci performing on stages nationally and internationally, but they don't really know the backstory. You know, they understand the glory but not the story. Right. So let's just start with, you know, the early beginnings before the fame. So you and your brother, um, Devante Swing, right. you were singing in your family's gospel group. Is that correct? Right. Well, my fa yeah, my father had a, a group, you know what I'm saying? My father, a lot of people don't know, my father was the first black, uh, actually, evangelist on TV along with Jim Baker on the 700 Club. Him and Jim Baker started together along with Tammy Faye Baker and, uh, we were kind of like his band and you know that's kind of like what we kind of evolved you know you know as as far as like artists but you know then we, we carried on my dad had the donny great delegation and um you know it just it just went on from there so yeah that's that's how we actually started wow you know what i find having conversations with entertainment legends such as yourself church is always the common denominator. So how did the congregation uh, feel when you started shifting into more secular mu music? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it was, we kind of like did it like un unknowingly to the church because our church, and this is, I, I, it shames me to say this, but I have to say it because it's a funny story. But, uh, you, you know, during church services, me and Devontae have been the instruments, you know, playing like doing an offering while my dad was preaching and everything. But we be playing, we put gospel words to like, you know, Prince's songs and Michael Jackson. So nobody really knew it. Nobody knew it. They thought, that, oh, those boys are so talented. You know, they just making up this beautiful music. One day a visitor came to our church and uh, I think we had, was playing, uh, I want to say it was Billy Jean's, I mean, uh, the, the bass on the Billy Jean, whatever. So one of, the, one of the guests at the church went to my dad and said, I didn't know that you, you let, you know, you let your band play. Uh, you know, they call it devil music. Devil music yeah. in the church. My dad's like, well, those are my sons. They, they only play gospel. I said, no, they play Michael Jackson. Name all the songs we play. And my dad confronted us about it, and he was livid. I mean, because you know, he was he was like, no, nah, my sons will never do that. But we were in fact playing. So that's really how my dad really found out that we were, you know, new secular music. You know what they call devil music at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a lot more of that story is going to be in our movie, so I can't give too much of it away. But yeah, a movie. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. I, I'm here for it. I can't give a lot of the backstory away, but yeah. Well, I just hope that you know it does better than the recent Lifetime biopic of Salt and Pepper. But that's a, another different story. <laughs> <laughs> that's another story that we'll, we'll we'll talk about later. But you know, just talk about you know the devil music. You know, I have a a similar um story as well. You know, just coming from a church background. You know, my parents mm -hmm. just always made sure that my brother and I we had God in our lives. And um, as they were practicing in the um, the church pews, gospel music, little old Sonia was cl crawling underneath the pews. Right, 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 right. Hitching a ride to the local football game. So right. you and I, <laughs> the devil's playground worked out very, very well for both yeah. of us. <laughs> but you know, something else during those early formative years where you and your brother were just a, a duo group introduced to um, KC and JoJo, who were in a, a separate gospel group. Tell us about how you met those two brothers, KC and JoJo. Um, well, man, well, we weren't actually a dual group. We was in my, we was part of my dad's band, which is called the Donnie Great Delegation. So it was like a, a band of like maybe six or seven people. It kept varying. My dad was interchanging pieces. He was always having different people come in and a different band all the time. But, you know, it was basically me, the focus started being on me and Devante. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so uh, we had in our church, you know, we have different artists and different visitors come to sing maybe on Sunday nights and, or, you know, doing a revival or whatever. And, uh, there's one particular girls group named uh what's the name of the group uh, see, unity unity was called unity and uh they would come and they were really pretty girls the four girls they could sing 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 these are what these tight dresses to our church <laughs> and so not the church <laughs> at the church at the church they, they was like our age so you know 
you know, me and the body kind of took a liking to a couple of girls in the group. And uh, they used to always tell us, you know, maybe like the second or third time they had visited, you guys got to meet Lil Cedric and, and, and Joe at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, which like from, the, you know, from from Lil Cedric and the Heli Singers. We was like, yeah, we heard of them, but, you know, now we do two different kind of music. So they started dating one of the girls in the group uh, out of Unity. And, uh, and uh, she's like, you got y'all got y'all got me. Y'all two sets of brothers got me. You got me. And it was just really, really, really set on us introducing each other. It was like, well, they do quartet music. You know, quartet music is like deep southern gospel leg slapping. Yeah. You know, the, the quartet. <laughs> that's what. And so it was like, well, that's not what we do. We do like more contemporary. You know, you know, just more pop. You know, kind of like soulful. In case them just do the straight. You know, the grits and the eggs and the collard greens type music. So we say, all right, we all right. Finally convinced us. All right. We'll meet them. So they set the meeting up, and uh, 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 one of the girls, two of the girls in the group, was, one was dating KC at the time, and one was dating Devante. So they brought us together. As soon as we walked in there, you know, it was just it was just all bad. It was just an all, all bad situation. And I was like, man, these niggas, I'm good. <laughs> and, I, and I walked out, and I was like, because it got really bad. And like I said, I can't give you all the details, but you'll see. We got really bad. You know, if you do a little research, you know the kind of story. But Casey pulled a gun out on me. And I was going to say, I already know that. He pulled yeah, a gun it, on it, you. It went bad. It went bad. So, and I was like, man, listen, you know, I'm on them. And, you know, Devontae stayed around. Him and Joda, like, man, let's just go over here, blah, blah, blah. So they started, they actually formed Jodeci, like, a couple of days later after that night. So it was just Joda and Devontae. Wow. So, so yeah. church singing teens who are also pistol packers. <laughs> <laughs> well you know you know see, people, people they get like a, a little a little you know like they come out of church but you know we're still human beings and we're still young we're still yeah. teenagers we're still you know preteens, and it was we're still wild you know what i'm saying because none of us really had to really commit to the same life that other people our age had you know we was used to traveling the world and touring and you know you become a little rebellious growing up and you know yeah. you just, for us, so that's kind of like what happened. It's yeah, like yeah, you crawl the same thing, you know what I'm saying? And look, church, at and look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned that you at that age, um, you were traveling nationally and internationally. How old were you at that time? Well, um, actually, when I first started traveling my dad, I was around six or seven years old. Wow. You know what I'm saying? We had we had like a tutor that would go, you know, come to hotels with us, he travel with us. Uh, you know, that's what we, we have been doing this for a long time, man. Really long time. Same thing with Casey and Joe, though. They were they were babies too. You wow. know, so, that's you know we was I got to watch my father work in the studio. That's why when it came time for us to go in the studio, we wasn't strangers to the studio. And people's like, y'all, you guys wrote produce your own album? Yeah, you know they brought Albie Shore to do, do a little couple of things on the shows around, like you know what I'm saying. But we was pretty much seasoning because watching my father how to blend harmony, how to you know stack harmony, how to do a lot of things in the studio from watching my dad. You right, know, right. So you already, kids you too, already. So. You already had some sense of formal training before you even entered into the music industry. And that's sometimes, you know, what's missing in today's um, singers. You know, right. they don't really have that formal training. They don't go through the journey. Um, they don't go through the boot camp in order to become artists, you know, successful artists such as yourself. But then I want to transition into, you know, no as a motivation, because you mentioned, you know, being a kid traveling nationally and internationally, someone introducing you to Casey or well, little Cedric. I know that part, little Cedric. That made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> little Cedric. Little Cedric. Yeah, little Cedric. Yeah. But the power of no as a motivator, as a motivator, your brother, uh, Devante Swing, he traveled all the way to Minnesota yeah. to Paisley Park, trying right. to get Prince to right. hear your music. And right. he or his team told you no. What was that like when Devante came back home to the camp and said Prince didn't want to hear anything? Um, well, he was he was he was heartbroken because he, he was like he, he idolized Prince, which, you know, Maybe a strong word to use, but he really, really that was like his inspiration. When he when we first got introduced to RB music, that's what he locked in on. He locked in on Prince. And that was his, you know, me, I was all over the place. I was Michael Jackson, Prince, hip hop, this, blah, blah. But Devontae locked in on Prince. And and uh, he's he's like, you know, Devontae's always been the type of person that if he said on something, he's gonna try to do it. And I remember the night, nobody knew he left. He told me, he said, Man, I'm going to Minneapolis. Just don't tell mom and him I'm leaving. And he was like 15 by the turn 16, he drove all the way to Minneapolis by himself. You know, wow. he jumped in the car and I, and I had to hold that secret. I couldn't even tell my mind. He just left. And he said, I'm going to go, I'm going to Paisley Park. He looked it up. 
and he drove out there and they he said when he got there he saw like a, a couple of people that was in the revolution he was just excited like hey you know this man he said nobody paid no attention they said nah and the, you know they stopped him and, and told him to leave oh and wow when he came back he was just really heartbroken and i think he went through his i hate prince phase for a minute <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he had been with Prince for a minute. But then, you know, then he just started, he just started doing his own thing. And he just started writing, you know, that's when he came up with the Come and Talk to Me's and, the, you know, the other, the other some of the other joints, you know, Father My Lady. And then he just, his mind went a whole different direction. Then when we met Casey and JoJo, it really went to a different whole level of, of his songwriting and, and producing and ideas and stuff. His vision just jumped somewhere else. So quick question. So when your brother Devante Swing traveled all by himself at the age of 15 to Minnesota to present mm -hmm. his music to Prince, did Casey and, and Jojo, were they a part of the group at that time? We haven't even met them yet. Oh. Yeah. No, we haven't even met them. He, he, he was just doing like his own thing. I mean, he had like a whole Prince vibe. Like, you know, like I wish I still had some of his early cassette tapes because it was just like another whole different type of thing. So, yeah. you know, that's why. That's why the girls felt like if we got together, we could create some kind of magic. So, and that's what that's what you know ultimately happened. So, t tell me, tell us a little bit how that conversation went when all four of you were in the room. Did it take a lot of convincing for you to form the group, or you know, was it seamless and easy and quick? No, I, no, I tell you, it was bad when we first met. It was, it was, I mean, <laughs> well, after the gun, after the gun told you know, it, Actually, I was done with them. I mean, I because I had my. I was like a local celebrity in Charlotte. That's all I knew. I was cool. I had my, I had a bunch of women. I had a, you know, I was famous around Charlotte. Everybody knew who Dalvin the Great was. So it was like, I was cool. That's all I knew. Wow. But I mean, you know, telling my father I had to share the spotlight in North Carolina. It was all me. I was the Bobby Brown of, of my neighborhood in North Carolina. You know what I'm saying? So I really didn't mind. I, Cause I, at the time I couldn't see what Devante saw. I knew I was something mm. big in North Carolina, but I, 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 I didn't know what, what his vision or where it would lead us. So, you know, when we took the trip to New York, I was like, man, I was just going. And he was like, man, you know, we should just, just be a group, you know, all four of us. And it was like, I just wanted to leave North Carolina because I just wanted to just experience life, you know, mm -hmm. so and then I just like got in a group and it was history after that, you know? Wow. So that's a perfect uh, segue into how the four of you traveled to New York City. Um, just finding an address in the yellow pages. Let me tell you, that's how I used to look for jobs in the 90s. Right, right. I used to go <laughs> to the yellow GPS, pages. Yes, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't on GPS. No, it wasn't a GPS. It wasn't people giving out. Thomas guy, like yeah, the Thomas guy, it was too hard to read. It was too much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the the four of you traveled. Was it here to Brooklyn, New York? Looking for uh, uptown we actually, records? We, yeah, this, this is a funny story. Uh, okay. we, we had never, none of us had ever been to New York. All the places we've been in the world, or in you know the United States, we, none of us have never been to New York. You know, my father never played there. Casey, you know, Lil and the, the Haley Singers never performed in New York. So we we got the address off the back of I, I want to say New Edition's album cover or God I wanted them by Brown. It's all the same label, MCA, and the address was 1775 Broadway. I still remember to this day. Um, and so that's all we knew. So we get we drive to 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 uh, New York City, and we lost already. So. And this is the funny part of the story. We didn't have nowhere to go. We had no money. We had nothing. We had spent all our money stopping at truck stop buying shades so we could look cool. We got to New York because we didn't know what the vibe was. So we finally get to New York. And uh, I remember I used to, I used to listen to a, a LL Cool J. And I think it was on his, I want to say, either Big and Denver album or a Bad album. He had a song called The Bristol Hotel. And and I said, let's find the Bristol Hotel. I don't know. We didn't know. We didn't know, and we didn't know what, what it was. But he's just talking about girls that we didn't know. I know he's talking about prostitutes. <laughs> we pull up, we pull up to the hotel. We finally found it after hours and hours and hours of driving around to find this little hole in the wall, nasty, nasty, super dirty, nasty hotel, Bristol mm -hmm. Hotel. And it's the famous Bristol Hotel that LL Cool J talks about in Queens. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like coming to America, almost. Yeah. <laughs> the Bristol Hotel with no money. So I think we sung for the lady at the front desk, and we said we don't have the money, but we'll pay you tomorrow. We got a record deal. We're selling all kind of stuff. You know, uh -huh. we get our regular label, and I know she's looking at us like, "What y'all doing at the Bristol Hotel?" Then, but yeah. right, <laughs> let us in the room. Let us in the room, and uh, the next day, once again, we set out to try to find uh, MCA, and we was lost again. And you know, you've been in New York; it's one way streets, all in Manhattan. Is one, if you lost, you lost. Yeah, we finally found it. You know, and you know, like I said, it was on and popping after that. On and popping. So you were, you got in front of the right people. They asked you to sing and then they bring you in front of 
Andre Harrell. Is that no, correct? No, happen at all. Tell, tell me. This is why <laughs> I'm, I'm so interested in this story. We got in front story. of the A&R, and they said we wasn't good enough. They said, no, y'all go back to North Carolina. He fell asleep. He fell asleep. And I want to call his name. And I tell us every interview I do for the rest of my life, I'm going to call your name. But I saw him one time after we had blew up. He said, man, why are you doing me like that? I can't even <laughs> it out no more. So I feel bad with it. So I won't even say his name. But okay. It's out there for on the records. I used to always call it because I, I said to this day, I told him for the rest of my life, every interview I do, I'm gonna tell everybody your name was. Because he did the same thing to Mary J. Blige, and he needed to be stuck. Because he would have had no jealousy or no Mary J. Blige. But to make a long story short, we put our demo tape on and he uh he fell asleep. And wow. I remember I woke him up. I said, excuse me, sir. And he just jumped up. He said, Oh no, no, that's not what we're looking for. Yeah, that's not good enough. It was like you know, y'all just go back to North Carolina and then, and, and, you know, try to just make something else or, you know, but we're not looking for that. So he put a tape in called a guy named Jeff Red, you know, uh -huh. Jeff, Red, uh, Jeff Red. And we was listening to Jeff Red, not taking that away from Jeff Red, but the songs that they played was like, you think that's better than ours? Right. <laughs> it was, I mean, it was like, it was like, come on, this nigga, this dude don't know. Uh -huh. so anyway, you know, I mean, I like, we ended up working with Jeff Red too. We ended up producing Jeff Red, my brother did actually. So, but anyway, uh, when the heavy these dancers heard us just we was pleading, like pleading, begging this guy, man, just listen to it. We can sing it live if our tape ain't good enough. Nah, it's okay. We just started singing. Luckily, I mean, this had to be like the grace of God, man. Heavy D's dancer G Wiz was walking by the door and he knocked on the door. And this was after hours. You got to imagine the office was closed, it was like seven o'clock in the afternoon. The office was closed at like five thirty, six o'clock. Mm -hmm. So he knocked on the door. And I was just shocked because I knew who he was. I listened to rap music. My brother didn't know who he was. I said, that's Heavy D's dancing. I was just like starstruck just seeing him. He yeah. said, who's that singing? He was like, that was us. He said, hold on for a second. He went and got heavy. Mm. And he walked in the room. You know, we was just over the moon. You know, wow. he, he, and he went and got Andre Harrell, the president. You know, God bless his soul. He passed away recently. But, and um, that was it. And that was it. He, wow. gave, us the, he gave us the money to get our stuff out to Bristol because they locked our stuff in the Bristol Hotel. Uh-huh. Yeah, that was a crystal. Yeah, he put us in like the, the Hilton downtown or something for a couple nice. days. Nice. Nice. Man. Yeah, I'm glad you got out of the Bristol. I, I yeah, 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 me too. Not uh, like not that I know of the Bristol personally, but you listen know. To <laughs> song, Bristol yeah. No, yeah. I know I have friends, you know, who frequented yeah. the Bristol, and that's a place where you know you might come home with some STDs and bed bugs. Yeah, I call anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything. So for you to go there, I'm just thankful that you're still alive. Yeah. Thank you. Me too. You know, so heavy D, um, he hears you, he puts you in front of Andre Harrell, who then decides to sign you. Is that correct? Yeah, well, Heavy, he, he we sung a couple of songs. We sung a couple lines of a song. He said, hold on for a second. He went and got Andre Harrell. Andre Harrell was on. And the crazy thing about this whole story is, we this this is crazy. Like, a lot of people just get left out of the story. But when we walked into the building of, of, of uh, MCA, we was on the elevator with Andre Harrell. He never said nothing to us. We was all like, man, we, who we gonna ask for? Who we gonna? We was in there having a whole conversation with this guy standing in the elevator. Was he never said a word? Wow. He never said, "I'm Andre." We was like, man, we just we don't know what to ask for. We try to get our plans, our lives together. What we gonna say? We don't know. And he gets off the elevator with us, walks the same way, keeps walking on in the back. We never knew who he was, so we went straight to the reception desk, and he just goes into the back. But you know, wow, <laughs> that was crazy. That's a lesson right there, you know, for people who are listening, you know, if you're on your way to meet someone either for a job interview or for an audition, I always tell people that the audition starts as soon as you leave home. The interview starts as soon as you leave home because mm -hmm. you never know who you're going to encounter. I had an interview one time and the person was seated next to me on the bus wow. and didn't even know. Didn't even know. So when they entered into my office, I looked at them and they were very, very shocked. And all I remember it was, yeah, I, I heard every single thing that you said on the bus and right. it really ruined their chances, you know. Right, but right. see, yeah. <laughs> you I, mean, never... luckily, we, I mean, luckily we were just like trying to just get together. But, you know, he was he was cool. He never said a word, though. He never said a word to us on the elevator. But that's a good point, though. You never know who you're talking to, who you're around, who's listening. You never know. You never know. But speaking of another person who was around at that time, but he was just an intern, Sean P. Diddy Combs. How did it yeah. come about where Andre Harrell trusted P. Diddy to kind of oversee your project and your image? Um, he was he was uh, when we first got he wasn't there. When we first got there. You know, everybody's a little older than us when we first got there. And it was 
it was hard for us to relate and communicate with, you know, with Andre couldn't hang out with us and he couldn't, we was just four, after we got to New York, y'all understand, we were still, I was still, I just turned 16 years old, you wow. know, so it was like, we were just wild, they put us in this, they stuck us in the projects in New York, we had never been to the project, it was, it was, it was just crazy. So by the time we, you know, it's by the time I started working on the project, they wanted somebody to kind of like uh, in our same age group, you know, that just could communicate and deal with us. Cause they was like, you know, these boys are just wild. So, you know, they, they kind of put him kind of like the chaperone on us, but he was just as wild as we were. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, but we had fun. We all had a lot of fun. And he mm -hmm. was just always on the go. Like I used to go out with, you know, with Puff dancing almost every other night. We used to go to the club. He took me to the tunnel. He took me like, around all the hip hop dudes. I mean, he was just one of them dudes, you know, wow. and, and he was just one of them guys that just could talk his way in anywhere. It was always live. Wow, so, wow. So we, we kind of entrusted him to, to you know, give us that up up north kind of flavor, you know what I'm saying? Cause you know, he's from, he was in school in DC, he was in New York and, you know, he just had the flavor that we just, we, we country boys. So we kind of just moved that on with right. him. So it's the way it kind of like the, the north, you know, I'm living up north, whatever. But just, you know, moonwalking backwards just a little bit, you mentioned that they put you to stay in the projects in the Bronx. Oh, oh my goodness. What was that like, you know, being these Southern boys, you know, coming to the, the belly of the beast, the projects in the Bronx, they could spot an, outs an outsider in a split second. Well, they, just, I mean, they did. I mean, like, you know, they used to call us, hey, little country. <laughs> <laughs> hey, little country. So it was like, <laughs> it was, it was just, it was a culture shock basically because you know we coming from you know from the church town southern gospel you know and we go straight to the to the hood the project yeah. you know roaches yeah. and rats in the park, <laughs> everything you know so it, it was like <laughs> but you know it, it it made it it built character like you know what I'm yeah. saying to to it, to us looking back you know yeah. we start we complained a little bit but we knew it was building something that you know that that was designing us for where we was about to go which we had no idea but we was. We know what it was building characters, it was building a lot of things that we needed to to yeah. come. I think to to move us to the next level. And a lot of people understand, like a lot of artists, we made you know the sacrifices is is much more rewarding than actually the you know when you actually get to where you want to go because you think about like how I made it here. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of artists are just instant success. You never really see them anymore. They just fall off the face of the earth because they don't know how to handle it. Right, right. And we saw we've been down to the bottom from the gutter. You know, and also that may happen because they never had to go through the trenches. So they right. don't really appreciate when the blessing is bestowed upon them because they didn't have to work hard enough for it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but it's nothing against you or, you know, the other members of Jodeci, you know, being from Virginia and, and, and North Carolina, why the, the projects in the Bronx treated you so bad. The projects. No, in, no, no. In, hold on. Let me correct. Let me say that in case. No, the, the, we love I me. Mean, the people in the projects treat us good. Okay. They did, oh, they love this. We used to open our window up and do play music for them. The whole projects, yeah, they, they love this. Like, nice. I like, was nothing. We had like equipment and everything. No, nah, they looked out for us, but it was just like they knew we was from the country and they just kind of took a liking to us. Yeah, they. Nice. Took, I mean, it was just a bad coming from like middle class North Carolina going to the projects in New York City was just. A That's a culture shock. shock. <laughs> yeah, people treat us good, though. They treat us really good. Yeah. That's a good, you know, experience because you know you have people who live in New York. Let's say they come from Brooklyn. They may visit the projects in Manhattan. Right. You could live in New York, but if you ain't from those particular projects, right. Right. you right. better right. tread lightly and have yeah. you know yeah. your friend come and meet you downstairs to yeah. escort you. So I'm glad you know that you had you know a good. They they saw the greatness. Yeah. They saw yeah. they, they the greatness. Love it, they love us out there. Yeah. So when it came time to create your image, you know, from my understanding, um, Andre Harrell wasn't really sold on the whole hip hop image, the baggy jeans. No. Because if I remember at that time, you know, we were marveling at groups such as, let's say, Boys to Men and New Edition. You know, they were very cookie cutter, straight R and B. You right. all bought the soulfulness, the hip hop, the infusion, the marriage was perfect. So talk about that experience, getting Andre Harrell, you know, on board with your image. Um, well, you know, Dre had this idea because like, you know, Dre didn't, he didn't, you know, he just saw, he didn't know what we were. He just knew we had something, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, he didn't know what it was. It's like, you know, you kept lighting the bottle. What you do is be open the top, but then you just let it sit in there. Right? You know, it's almost like that kind of concept. But he knew he needed to let it out. But once it comes out, what how to harness it? You know what I'm saying? So, and uh, we always teach like I see y'all in these suits and you know he's, he's singing love songs, blah blah blah. But we knew that wasn't us. We didn't want to come out like that. We didn't want to come out like that from the jump. 
So, but we didn't know what exactly, you know, how we wanted to look. It was like, we always said, we want to be a group that guys can relate to us. Like you see hardcore dudes driving down the street playing Jonesy. That's what we, that's what we saw. So how do we get that across without being, because you know, back in the day, guys didn't go by like love songs unless their girl wanted to hear them. Right. You know, they wouldn't drive down the street, you know, the niggas in a Jeep bumping Jonesy. They would, I mean, uh, you know, that wasn't going to happen. So yeah. it's like, how can we make that happen? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So we said we had to be relatable. We got to be relatable to the average, ordinary drug dealer, thug, just a regular dude on the street, whoever. And yeah. that's how, that's how. So let's just be us. Let's just be us. What we like. I mean, what, how do, you know, and so that's, that's just how it came about. We just want to be love it. Well, standing in your truth and being authentic, you know, that's another aha moment. That's another teachable lesson, you know, because a lot of times these artists, they go in front of these major record labels and they want to create their image for them. And yeah. a lot of artists, you know, they kind of fumble and fold because they're just so excited to be in the presence. Right. And mm -hmm. so excited to possibly have an album release that they totally forget who they are. So right. I'm glad that once again, you know, you all stood in your truth. But, you know, but during this whole formal training, you know, they prepared you at Uptown Records by being uh, doing the background vocals for Father MCs, treat them like they want to be treated. Talk right. about that. Um, that, was, that was like the very first time that we was on the video set. And, you know, Father was the next artist, you know, the next artist coming out of Uptown. Like, so they had put a lot of, a lot of things into his project, a lot of energy. And he, they didn't have, they felt like they didn't have the perfect single. So they was like, well, you know, hey, let's get Jodeci to just sing the hook, you know? So, and that was just, that's how it came about. And from then it just, we just thought, I was like, okay, another, you know, quick couple of minutes in the studio and the song just took off. You know, yeah. it just took off. It was unexpected. You yeah. Know? It just yeah. took off. You know, I, I had the urge to really sing the chorus just now, but I was like, I'm not even going to sing it. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> not going to do it. But then, you know, 1991 comes and Jodeci steps on the scene with their first album. And we hear songs such as Forever My Lady, Come and Talk to Me. And by this time, you were still, what, like 16 or 17 years old? Yeah. Where did those lyrics come from with your fast boys? Where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> Being fast, I guess. <laughs> no, you know, you know, the crazy thing is, those songs were, were written, like like I said, when, before we left North Carolina. We just went and added a couple things here and there. But those songs are already written. We used to write songs to our girlfriends all the time. And they were so amazed. But it's like, I guess it was just something that came natural to us. You know, and like... You know, when Andre, they put us in the studio, they didn't believe, like, the, the the catalog of songs we already had made when we got there. You know, we had, like, what, 52 songs or something? And yeah. they, like, it was it was crazy. They couldn't believe it. Wow. You know, like, even, like, if you go fast forward, if you go to the last project that they, that they put out, they try to call it Jodeci album, The Past, Present, and Future, every moment was supposed to be on Forever My Lady album. Oh. You know, so these songs are like written back then, and you know, a lot of songs we just kind of threw like, okay, let's just throw it in this album. This is a good song, let's, you know, like, but if it ties into the theme, all of our songs, all of our albums had a theme, all of them had like a concept. So some songs didn't work, don't mean it wasn't great songs or good songs, it just didn't work for the, for the album at the time. So, wow, well, but you know, like I said, you know, such strong ly lyrics, you know, I can't even complain or judge. You know, I look at my life now and I said, you know, I can't believe in junior high school, like I was singing songs that I should not have been singing. I did not understand it at all. But I'm just going to assume that as you all were writing these lyrics, I'm just going to get a little bit personal. I'm going to assume that you weren't even virgins at that time because you were exploring love like you had touched and sucked a few things. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. But I mean, you gotta look at it like this. I think people can fantasize about things they're actually not. I mean, you could be an actor play a murder, don't make you a murderer. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I mean, I'm not gonna say we were, we weren't, but you know, <laughs> hey man, I gotta leave something to your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. you enough research, I'm sure you can find an answer to that question. Now. Got you, got you. But the album was a huge success. Right. Three million albums sold. Right. Is that at that time how you measured success or did you measure your success in another way? Was it when you finally signed your contract to be on Uptown Records? How did you measure success? Uh, to be honest, we're just going to go a little bit deeper than probably what you think. But I measured it after seeing all the wolves and all the mm. snakes come out the grass and out the, out the hills. And you like everybody want a piece of you. You like I'm just and I and I think is I think in a lot of artists, while artists get taken advantage of because you don't see this coming because your only focus is I want to be a musician. 
Right. You know, you don't know the magnitude. You got people screaming at you and you go into countries, people can't even speak English saying your name. So these things are a distraction from what really going on around you. So we never really see, saw ourselves as being like, you know, famous or anything. We were just having fun, just doing what we love to do that we've been doing our whole life. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like, but when I started seeing the, the 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 vision that people try to attack the group and this now, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is what it's about. And that's what comes with the territory. So that's when I started seeing we must really be something because everybody is trying to tear us apart or trying to come in between. And so that's when you, that's when you notice it. Yeah. So the people who try to, if you, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't catch that, then you ain't really doing nothing. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. I always say if they ain't talking, then you ain't really doing nothing. You ain't really doing nothing. You know, but the people who were trying to cause some sort of division amongst the group, were they insiders of the music industry or was it the general public? Well, I think that, I mean, for our situation, I think everybody's situation may be a little different, but us, we, we I mean, like, we country boys, like, we, you come around us, and sometimes we can be really gullible, so we let a lot of people in, you know, people can, it's like, you know, cancer, they work from inside out, you know what I'm saying, so, you know, you don't see it coming, but it's a lot of people that you invite into your, into your circle, until you really realize the purpose of the people there, so it can so happen true. any kind of way, you know. So true. You know, I'm, I'm in this phase myself of evaluate and eliminate. You know, there are people who I've invited into my personal and professional circle. And then, you know, you look at what they're trying to do to undo, you know, what you're doing. And then you realize, you know, these are not the type of people that I need around me. Right. Um, so, you know, navigating that in the music industry, it really seems to be inevitable. Um, how can people like what are some signs that people should watch out for if they're entering into the music industry about what division looks like? Give us an example. Um, let me see. That's a good question. I think that if somebody if somebody to me, if somebody comes to you and tries to demean somebody that that's close to you without even knowing, you know, say it's it it's it, it, it becomes okay, then why why are you trying to turn me against this person? Or why are you trying to pull me away from this person? You know, what I'm saying if somebody always coming to you and telling you, "Oh, you better, you don't need this, or you don't need them, you better than this," and blah blah blah, it's always those 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 subtle things that get your mind working. Well, you know what, this and that. So I mean, it, it happens to everybody. It happens to every group. It's not just it's every group, whether you're white, black, and, or, or whatever. But the the thing about this, this, I hate to say this, but the thing about most black groups, you never see black groups really unite back. You know, because it becomes something that's so minute that turns to something we have no idea what it might be. And and uh, that's what the pattern I see with most black groups, whether they're female or male. And everybody, what happened to this group? What happened to this group? And it's always somebody comes in and intertwines itself and becomes a cancer. And it's sometimes you can't cure cancer. Sometimes you can't. Right. So, but you look at, you look at, you know, white rock groups or white groups and they go make $220 million. They don't even have to speak to each other for 10 years, but they go yeah. make money because it becomes a business to them, which is smart. You know, we our egos won't allow us sometimes to, to, to cross that bridge. And I've seen that happen to a lot of my peers, you know, that surround us. So yeah. And, so, and that goes back in the day. I mean, you go from groups way back in the day, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's just something that we have as melanin, you know, coded people, you know, just something that I hope that we really get away from. So many people have been allowed and given full agency to come and disrupt, right. you know, and, and that's something that we as a people, we need to recognize and we need to eliminate immediately. How did the members of the group handle that? Like, were they receptive to the divisive tools that people tried or did they recognize it and say and come back to the other group members and say, listen, this is what's going on. Don't believe it. I mean, on a few occasions, I mean, but, you know, everybody's human. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody plant the right seed in your garden, the tree, I mean, it's going to begin to blossom. Yeah. You know, they just got to plant the right seed. You know, sometimes it happens. And it's, there's been a lot of people that's, that's tried to come and divide and conquer us, and it didn't happen. So, you know, there's been some times when there's been questions. I mean, because we family. We fight like family sometimes. And right. some things make sense to somebody. It won't make sense to the other person. Some things may and, and may not. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you go through that, when, especially when you reach a level of success that, that Jodeci did at a young age. And. You know, as you as you grow, you make all uh, you, you find all these stumbling blocks and all these pitfalls, and you want to blame somebody else for why it happened. And, but that goes when you you trying to move, you know, for professional, successful people as a unit. You yeah. know, you just get to a certain level. You have your own friends, your own teams, your own managers, your own lawyers, and everybody got their own ideas. Yeah, yeah. So it becomes whose idea is the best ideas. Mm. <laughs> so it becomes a conflict. Right. That's why things sometimes, you know, a lot of fans don't understand why things don't move like they want to move but 
everything now becomes a business because it's a business for everybody. And the mm -hmm. extension of all the people, you got their families that you take care of, their families, their families. So it just it, the tree never stops going. Once the roots spread out, it never stops going. So when somebody don't think it's profitable for them, it's, it's not the right idea. So it just yeah. it's like that. So you you four were still kids teenagers right. and just navigating um, the music industry and also the streets of New York, who was around to protect you? God, wow. <laughs> basically, that's it. And so uh, no, no parents, no parents, no, no family members. Nah. Wow. And when I was in New York, my mother didn't even know I was gone. I left and called till I was in New York. She knew I was gone. She said, boy, you get your butt back tonight. I, said, I live in New York now. I was gone. I was out. I was out. I was coming back. <laughs> I think that's that's in the war. She probably drove to New York and found me, but I, was, I, I, I get it. I had an occasion I was on a where mission, man, I was on a mission. Oh, oh, me too. I had an occasion where you know my my mom thought I was uh, on Long Island, but I was at Howard Homecoming. Turn it up. Hey, <laughs> Being fast. <laughs> yeah, being fast is what they said in the South. <laughs> being fast, huh? Fast phone call. Oh, huh, the most fast tail girls. They the most fast tail girls alone. Yes. <laughs> so then, you know, let's go to 1993, where your second album um comes out, Diary of a Mad of, of a Mad Band. Right. Right. So at that point in time, Jodeci considered leaving Uptown Records for Death Row Records. Talk no, no, about that, that. That wasn't true. No, I mean, that no? wasn't. That wasn't. That, that, it, um, what happened was, you know, as you as you get in your career, then it, it becomes more about just being on stage and just, you know, being a being the circus monkey. It's it's like okay, now let me see where all my my peanuts are going. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't keep just throwing me peanuts and want me to perform and selling millions of records. And I, mm -hmm. you know, we all still living in the same house, and that don't make sense. You know, everybody was driving Rolls Royce and we still sharing a car. That don't make sense. I mean, adding up. You know, we made the biggest things in sliced bread and we still even have a car to drive. Wow. You know, we got tens of thousands of people fainting and falling out like we the Jackson 5 and we still have a car to drive. Something ain't right. No. So then you step back and, and you figure out, wait a minute, wait a minute, where's our money going? Mm. And, you know, and, and sometimes, and I'm not blaming anybody pointing any fingers because you know, sometimes if you don't take care of your business, your business will take care of you in the yes. wrong way. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, we happened to meet Suge Knight in uh, L.A. And I'm just I'm skipping ahead a little bit. But we happened to meet Suge Knight in L.A. And, uh, you know, he had, he had a, 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 a real serious conversation with us. And, you know, we was talking about just simple things like, hey, what kind of cars you got to drive? What you mean? We thought, what you mean, drive cars? We ain't sold no records yet. And he said, do y'all not know how many records y'all sold? We said, no. And he, I mean, he broke everything down to us. And from that day forward, it's like a light bulb came on. You know, we, he can understand why we didn't even have a car down yeah. to that thing, you know. So it's like, after that, then, you know, it's the same typical story with most groups. When I mean, you don't, like I said, you don't take care, of your, you take care of your business. Either your business take care of you, somebody else will take care of your business for themselves. And that's just basically what happened. You know, we, we and should say, well, let me just come in and help y'all renegotiate and this and that but he never tried to sign us to death row you know although me and my brother did a lot of producing for death row you know my brother did tupac, tupac. I, worked, I worked on some tupac uh jewel i worked on with dog pound a couple artists from death row but that was all, that's the only affiliation we really had with death row was just friends with Shook. you know got you he, yeah, never, so tried, he never tried to manage us never tried to sign us well, that's a, a good story about Shook Knight because, you know, most people just talk about him negatively. And I always say, you know, there's another side to the coin. Um, right. But, you know, just knowing the business and, and contracts, that can be a tricky, tricky experience. Uh, yeah, I, I remember um, before I signed a contract with a former partner, I had hired a lawyer. And just because of the fact that I hired a lawyer, it caused this huge argument. Like, why would you hire this lawyer to look at a contract? You think that I would, would lie to you? And I said, okay, because this individual is getting upset because I hired a lawyer to look at a contract, that lets me know that something's not right. right. So what was that conversation mm -hmm. like when you realized that you should probably negotiate Jodeci's contract and you went back to Andre Harrell at Uptown Records? Were they receptive to renegotiating well, your contract? We didn't go back. Actually, Silk went. You know, he took us one oh. That conversation, but I think well, a lot of rumors got, because the conversation got pretty heated. I mean, it got, it got pretty bad, but you know, I mean, Shug was just like, you know, he, he didn't, he was very professional. You know, he just, he, 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 just, he just showed us on paper in front of them where our money was. 
Mm-hmm. So that's just basically what it was. And I mean, it was it wasn't no, you know, we, we still continue to, to roll with Andre Rell, although he was a little uncomfortable that Shook was in our, you know, in our ally of ours, but we never we would never let Shook pose no threat to Andre. You know what I'm saying? Shook never did. Mm-hmm. You know, he was he was very professional. You know, it was just a, a, I mean a, a conversation to where we got kind of upset because we felt like we've been lo- so loyal to Uptown Records, and this is how y'all doing this, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it was more like we were kind of hurt behind the whole thing when we mm-hmm. figured out, you know, the situation we was in, how bad of a deal that we had signed, or they kept us in even after being so successful after the first album, you know. So, but it is it happens, you know. Like I said, so were you ever able to get a a better contract at that yeah. point after? Great, great. The same day, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, even though they gave you the money that you deserved. Sometimes it can be, like you mentioned, animosity, intention. Did the record label start treating Jodeci any differently? Maybe marketing them less, well, um, working think, with them less? You know, this was on the heels of, um, it, I think they were a little more fearful because they thought Suge was, you know, Suge was just a bully, but he wasn't. You know, I think they were a little more fearful because we had somebody that could that could that was looking out for us, you know, and I feel like they kind of felt we pulled away from them, but we didn't, you know, because after that, soon after that, MCA wanted to, dissolve Uptown and just have Jodeci, but that directly on MCA. You know, they wanted to take us, marry all the acts that were successful and put them directly on MCA. And we told Andre, hey, we'll roll with you, you know, we'll roll with you. Even after all of that, we still, we'll roll with you. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll stick with you. But, you know, it ended up being with the Motown and we ended up going to MCA anyway. But nah, it wasn't no animosity, I don't think, between us and Andre. Good, good. You know, because some people may be fearful to speak up, but this is once again a teachable moment about standing in your truth, speaking up, sometimes sometimes having an advocate with you in the room and going after and not being afraid to ask for what you, what is rightfully yours. Right. So I'm glad that Jodeci created that moment in history because, like I said, there are going to be so many people who learn from just that experience alone. So right. then we 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 go to your next album, Jodeci's next album, um, The Show, um, The After Party. What was it? No, The Show, The After Party, The Hotel. Mm-hmm. And we had such hits. My favorite, Freaking You. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Fast, fast. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Do all albums just being fast. Do all albums. I was. <laughs> I've calmed down now. <laughs> I reserved that for Valentine's, New Year's <laughs> Eve, and Christmas. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> but talk about the group's progression once that album was released. How did you grow at that point? Uh, well, I mean, tremendously. You know, uh, me as far as a producer, I mean, I was always doing production on albums, but this, I really just grabbed the, you know, grabbed the horse by the reins. I just really just found my niche of where, how, what kind of producer I wanted to be. You know, although like on both the albums I did production, but on this one, I really knew where I was as a producer, as a arranger, as a, you know, everything when it came to the production side. And we knew we knew exactly where we were. We knew who we were as a group. We knew what we had to do. And at that time, that's when Devontae had the basement. You know, we had Missy Elliott, Timbaland, Genuine, uh, Static, uh, you know, Player, Sister, which, you know, had Sugar. I mean, um, Tweet, uh, you know, a, a lot of groups that and that was, was all like a big family then. So it was a different experience because we was working on so many projects at one time. And me and Devante is working on the Dangerous Mind soundtrack with Michelle Pfeiffer. She came to the studio, and you know, it was just a lot of things going on at the time. And so, you know, but we, as as far as the, the music, we knew we're gonna make a song about being on tour, being at the hotel, being. I mean, that's so we that's everything we did was that. You know what I'm saying? Was just that. So. And now that's how that came about. But that that album in particular, you know, like I said, one of my all time favorites. Any album that Joe DeC released is a definite favorite of mine. Thank but you. I definitely saw a shift in that album. It just seemed as if now you're giving us access to your rock star lifestyles. The instruments in that music it just seemed harsher. It seemed um, to be more bass in that. Yeah. Um, is that correct, or am I just no, hearing? No, you're right. I mean, you're right. Like I said, it was it was more like. It, it was like we're gonna take you on a, on a Jodeci tour, not on backstage, on stage, off the stage, the hotel, basically what goes on. Like you heard a lot of that, and it was just like a lot, of, a lot of a lot of skits were actually real skits. You know what I'm saying? So it was like we just put a lot, and we sat down creatively and understood from the top to the bottom of the album where it was gonna be. Like I said, some songs we did didn't make the album. We did not. Nah, that's that. 
So and if you listen to the song, it flows. It never stops from the interlude to connect everything together. It never stops playing. Yeah. Except, yeah. Uh, at the end, that's it. I love it. You know, as you were speaking about the skits, you know, that uh, came before each song, my right. mind just went to um, a recent release of Jasmine Sullivan's Hotels. Mm -hmm. And it was so reminiscent of the 90s music, even, you know, R&B and hip hop, where there were skits before the actual song. Right. So to hear Jasmine Sullivan now go back to, you know, that formula that worked so well, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely here for it. Um, but then after that album, Jodeci disappeared. What was the reason for that? Well, I mean, you know, I think creative, creatively, everybody needs to just be be themselves. And I think everybody wanted to do that. You know, it, it, it's like <clears throat> everybody was focusing on different things and things started to, be a, started to be a distraction to what, you know, our nucleus was, was Jodeci and everybody was just doing their own thing. And I just think everybody, you need to just express yourself some kind of way. And I think if not, it builds up tension. It builds up a lot of diversity within the group. Because like I said, once you have success on your own, when you move out, it's, just, it's hard to, to, to rein in ego sometimes. And after that, you know, we just felt like, hey, man, I, just, I have these ideas I want to do. And some of my ideas ain't Jodeci ideas. Right. And, you know, some of Devontae's ideas ain't Jodeci ideas. Some of Casey's ideas ain't Jodeci ideas. And same thing with Jojo. It's not Jodeci ideas. But individually, whether people accept it or not, that's your ideas. And as an artist, you should be allowed to express yourself however you want to, whether people receive it or not. As long as you can express the way that you believe that's who I am. Now come together, we're a melting pot of everything that forms the magic. But individually, we are who we are individually. So, you know what I'm saying? And people sometimes get upset because, you know, individually, we're not collectively, don't sound like Jodeci, because we're not Jodeci without all four pieces of Jodeci together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and I think that, you know, knowing that we sometimes, you just got, you know, you just got to find and do what you want to do and feel what's necessary. No. So if I'm hearing you correctly around that time, you know, were there individual egos amongst the group or within the group that really caused the, the group separation? I mean, have you ever seen uh, the Michael Jordan documentary? No. The Last Dance? No. We should watch that. It's really good. I, I, it's on my to watch list. Definitely. Yeah, you must watch it. Must, you must see. I mean, it's, you know, it's hard to. I wouldn't say egos because we know each other. You know, it's hard for somebody to have ego. When we when we start together, struggle together, how can I have ego with you? I know exactly who you are and what you're not. You know, it's it's, it's most of the time when the, the, the way you fight yourself and the people you fortify yourself around will, will can create this mm. false sense of, of something within the, that don't even exist. And if you don't pay attention, you'll start believing it is what it is. And that's just sometimes what happens. And like I said in group, I don't think that like, because we, we, we are egos, we hate each other. We don't hate each other. You know what I'm saying? We don't dislike each other. Uh, they might not like some things I do and vice versa. That's because we family. You know, you can like everything in family do or even say, but don't mean that you don't like each other. Sometimes things just work better when you figure out something or get out to a system that you need to do sometimes. So true. So true. You know, you, you also mentioned, you know, there was a point in time where you all went your separate ways musically. And we as listeners and music lovers, we definitely heard the distinction between you and your brother, Devontae Swing, and JoJo and Casey. And it really made me think, was Dalvin and Devontae Swing the, 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 the magic, the magic behind Jodeci? Did you all write the lyrics? Did you all create the, the instrumentation um, that kind of branded the Jodeci sound? Did you, were you too responsible for that? Um, I'll say, I'll say this. Um, if you listen to me away from Jodeci or Devontae away from Jodeci, Casey away from Jodeci, I mean, you can almost tell what it is that we, that we put into the, th to, to, to the pot to make the magic. I don't think two of us just could have made the magic or, you know, a lot of people think, oh, Casey, it wouldn't be no Jodeci without Casey and Jojo. Well, I beg to differ. You know what I'm saying? It might not be Jodeci, but there'll still be a doubt in Devante and there'll be a case in Jojo. You know what I'm saying? But but people think that because they don't understand, and I'm trying to say this in a very political way, but people understand like if Case and Jojo's Jodeci, why Case and Jojo don't sound like Jodeci? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, doubt in Devante don't sing in Jodeci, but why Case and Jojo don't sound like Jodeci once again? You know, but it is, I mean, it is almost, it's almost like I have to ignore the ignorance sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't like explaining things that should be understood all, all the time because I give people a lot of credit to be more smart than what they are sometimes and they're really not. Right. So, right. I mean, you just got to just 
hey, it is what it is. I mean, like I said, at the end of the day, when we all four together, it's magic. And like I, I get said, it. I get it. And that's just, I get it. You know. you, you know, individually, people can be good. But as a collective, they can be even better. Yeah, you know, yeah. it doesn't negate th their individuality and people, you know, really don't understand. And that goes back to, once again, you know, people just trying to divide the group right. and, and, and separate them, you right. know, and, and that's not, you know, what I hear when I hear the Jodeci sound or the, the individual sound. Um, so I am glad that, that you mentioned that. Um, there have been so many artists, you know, since um, Jodeci left the scene that has sampled your music. I would say most recently uh, Cardi B and, and um, what is his name? Bruno Mars. Mm -hmm. um, Please Me. How did you feel about that when you heard that come on the airwaves? And how do you feel when artists sample your music? Um, well, you know, it, it's, um, I mean, I, I sample too. I mean, I take a lot, of, I listen to a lot of old music. I mean, I sample a lot of people's music like back in the day. So, I mean, it's flattering. But I also give artists homage. And, I, and that's the thing. You know, a lot of artists, they come out and use Jodeci, 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 Jodeci. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to, to, to say Jodeci as far as like, yeah, I'm inspired by Jodeci. Some people do. But, you know, me, I love talking about where I get inspiration from. You know, and I dig, I dig back, you know, I, I go back to the James Browns and the People who laid this foundation for everybody from the beginning who broke the color barriers. Well, what was possible for us to even do what we do these days? You know, we we've set another layer of that foundation for like a lot of new artists. But it's, it's I think it's more of an ego for them to say, well, you know, I copy Jodeci. I, even I, I look at I look at niggas on Instagram mm -hmm. that don't follow me, and I go and I and I post some of an outfit and me having on. Two weeks later, this dude has some the same outfit I got on. I'm like, what, really, man? I'm like, and it pisses me off. But then I'm like. And I put a side by side picture. I'm like, I should just post it and just start posting <laughs> all these niggas. Is, and they don't want. It. I mean, but then I, you know, I stop and I laugh. I was like, you know, but you know, if that's the case, I should get mad. A lot of army groups that came out after because everybody wanted to have a Jodeci. Everybody yeah. wanted to dress like Jodeci. Everybody wanted to sound like Jodeci. So I can't be mad, but it's just a little annoying sometimes because everybody look at me like, oh, you trying to be like what you got? I'm like, no. You want to see this picture I took four months before this dude even put it up? But wow. it's, you know, it's it's cool. I, I just. I, I laugh, I get annoyed and I laugh, but you know. But yeah. what I'm saying is, I said it to say this. It's, it's different because I I give props where props are due. And a lot of artists now don't. It's like, oh, I created this. And then you want it so bad, it's destroy that. And But then I was like, you know what? I just, you know, whatever. I just yeah. let them have it. So. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm in, well, learning how to be better at uh, picking and choosing my battles, you know, even if, we, we called it biting back in right. the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They biting, they biting. They biting, biting my style. But I find that, you know, and, and it's not to speak ill of, you know, this new younger generation, um, but you and I grew up in a time where, we always paid homage to the people who came before us, you know, just giving respect. But I find that with this new generation, they act as if they woke up and created that's themselves. Point. That's my point. That's my point. And that's my and, point. So, but you know what, though? You know what? I mean, at some point, people say, well, this ain't real music. But to, to people that listen, that's real music to them. And, I, and mm -hmm. I'll never try to discredit nothing they do or nothing like new artists do because. To their generation, people that follow, listen, it, it, it my, that's music to them because when in the beginning, people told us that our music wasn't wasn't good. Or mm -hmm. when it was rock and roll first started, when rap first started, everybody got when it was something new. I think everybody kind of shut down to it. Like you know, me, music for me is the music I'm making, the music I listen to, and the music I love. But not saying that I'm discredited anything that's happening now. This is not the music that I that I create, but it's created for the people that love it. So I, I don't knock it. You right. And I don't never not say it's not real music because it is real music. People that love it. That's their music. Right. And right. I, and I'll be uh, selfish and say, oh, well, Jonas is the only real music. That's not true. Yeah. That's not true for me to say. So I would never say that. No. So, so I always I always have that conversation with my father. He listens to today's music and he's just like, that's trash. And I have to explain to him, this is the evolution of music. Yeah, and it may that, not be for you, but this is the evolution of music. And, you know, there will come a point in time where I, I look at music or my daughter will look at music and say, you know, that music trash. <laughs> it isn't for you. <laughs> you know? but, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just how it happens. Everything's a revolving door though. Yeah. You know, it, is. So, it is. It is. So is there is there a current artist who you would be admired if they kind of sampled, 
a Jodeci song? You know, I mean, I've seen everybody, the biggest artist that's out right now in hip hop is Drake, and he sampled Jodeci all day long. You know, he sampled a bunch of Jodeci stuff. So, I mean, that's a little, you know, that's 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 flattering, but. Has he ever given you credit for it though? Yeah, him, and Trace, him and J. Cole made a song called uh, Screaming Like Jodeci's Back, which is cool. I mean, they reached out to me personally say, hey, man, I like y'all niggas and that like that, you know? Mm, so, how do you feel about that? I don't feel any kind of way. I mean, Drake, Drake, Drake don't pay my bills. So I could care less. I mean, gotcha. it is what it is. I like Drake. He's a dope artist, but yeah. you know, I don't, I don't lose sleep at night. Got you. You know, for me, it's like, you know, keeping the music alive. You know, you may not get your flowers that way by them calling you on the phone and say, listen, I just sampled, you know, your music or this is an homage to Jodeci. But keeping the music alive, you know, I guess that's a direction that we have to look at in order as a payment of respect nowadays. Right. I mean, well, you know, I mean, but I mean, look at it like this, keeping it alive. Why? To take credit that you did it because people that, that hear you do it. Then it came from you. That's like when when I when sometimes I play songs of young people that that sample like an old song back in the day. It's like, oh, that's what's it? I was like, no, it's not. That's Luther Vandross. Right. No, I'm, not. I'm like, yes, it is. Yeah. I'm like, but see a lot. So so is it really keeping the music alive, or are you still in trying to yeah. steal it? I mean, what, which one is it? That's a that's a fine line. If you say, well, yeah. it was a Jodeci record, blah blah blah, I got, or or you know, or this record I got, blah blah blah. They're always trying to say, well, this is something I created. Or trying to fool the public into something that you created, because you know a lot of people do their homework or research. Is that keeping it alive? Right. I, I was just trying to be nice, Mr. Dalvin. Yeah. You know, I'll just say it. They are thieves. No, 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 I get it. No, I was really just trying to play nice, you know. <laughs> but you know, I feel that if you sample someone's record, there should be a conversation about that. Right. And you should at least let the general public know that you are not the creator of, you know, that right. sound of, mm -hmm. you know, that sample. Um, I believe there should be some form of reciprocity and acknowledgement that this didn't come from you. Right. So I was just trying to be nice. That's all. But now that I know, I don't have to be nice. <laughs> well, I was asking you a question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm I'm going to sit down and try to sign, you know, get a get a poll. I mean, a, a vote right. going. That we should. I mean, I could care less. Like I said, you know, sometimes when this is my thing right here. You know, I've helped a lot of people along the way in this journey that's become very successful. I've helped a lot of people. I haven't heard one artist go back and say, well, I, Mr. Dalvin found me or I'm receiving this award. I want to thank Mr. Dalvin or Devontae. I haven't heard one. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about people I pulled, lived in my house, fed, gave cars to, pay for the uh, pay for funerals that are, for, the, for family members I've never, never even met. But mm -hmm. I've never heard one of them say yet. I want to thank Mr. Dalvin, Devontae, Jodeci for giving me my stuff. I haven't heard one of them say it yet. Not one. Not so one. Does, so does that I'm make talking, you... I'm talking about artists that I've that sold millions and millions of albums, made millions and millions, millions of dollars. That I took from sleeping on the floor, sleeping in my, putting in my house, and giving them my car to have, not nothing. I've heard it yet, but I mean, do I go out looking for it? Nah, right. that's what it is. You know, so, so does that does that make you approach the music industry and the people within the music industry a little bit differently? Does that make you lead with more trepidation? I mean, you know, as a business person, I wish I'd have made a lot of a lot of different decisions because. You know, you look at all the stuff that you out of pocket with these stuff. You're like, damn, if I'd have had them sign papers and said, but that's not the type of person I'm. I'm the type of person. If you don't want to be with me, then I'm not gonna hold you against your will. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like you should have to be tied to me. You really don't want to be there. So I think that's this mistake that me and my brother both made because we we're following with our hearts and not with our minds as far as business. Like, you know, this person would never mm -hmm. do. I thought I'm putting millions of dollars into your pocket, your family's pocket, when you ain't even guaranteed to make a dollar. Then you're gonna make millions of dollars and you don't even say thank you. Or acknowledge me at a war show, or you know, I mean, it, it, it gets under your skin a little bit because I'm human. But mm -hmm. I don't kind of think about it. Even when, only when I'm asked about it, then I let people know how I feel. But it's not nothing that I hold on to. And when I see these people, I'm high and by, I'll give them a hug and handshake, and keep it moving. Got you, got you. you but know? you recently released um, a new single. Um, yeah. Talk about that. Give us the title and tell us about the new song. It's good times, which actually. Uh, the remix comes out on Friday, so uh -huh. it, it's it's pretty cool. Um, it was a song, you know. It, I was actually working on my, another solo album, and uh, when the pandemic happened, I just kind of did a whole one eighty and went the whole different direction because it was like everything was just depressing. Everything was like, ah, can't leave the house, can't do this, can't blah blah blah, and you know. And I just wanted something just to pick everybody up, and it, it was like, listen, you know. And I, we always say, well, I can't wait till we start having good times again and get out and roll around and. 
and be on stage. And that's just how it came together, basically. And I was driving on the freeway, and I just, the words came to my head, so I made a U-turn, went back home, and I just made the record, you know? Well, it is definitely uplifting. It is much needed um, in this time. I remember hearing that song, Good Times, for the first time, and it, it made me get up out of my chair. And, well, the you know, remix is really different. The a whole, a whole, really? a whole different animal. Yeah, so make sure you get it Friday or check it out Friday. So, yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait. So Mr. Dalvin is back, you know, with um, new music. It's 2021. Yeah. Um, do you think that your sound will fit in with today's music? Are you kind of nervous about that um no because you know it i really don't make music to fit in anywhere i just like that's one thing josie we never made music to fit in it's like we always create our own lane it's like me as a solo artist you know people just oh well you know case and jody don't want to do that but like i said things will be uh, you know known but at the end of the day i make music that i like as long as i like i'm cool with it then whether you like it or not you know it's, that's on you Gotcha. I can't worry about, I don't follow trends the way I dress, the way I, I don't follow what people want me to do or think I should do. I follow what makes me comfortable and what makes me happy. Mm. Two people like my record. That's two more people that heard it, that liked it, that when I made it. So it, it doesn't matter. I'm going to continue just putting out records until it's time for us to just jump back on the Jodeci ship and sell away. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to continue making records. I enjoy doing it. And now that independent artists have the freedom to just make records whenever you want to, I'm not restricted by a record label. I can put records out every week if I want. And that's, I enjoy making music. I make songs almost every day. I'm going to keep putting out good music that people, you know, somebody like it, some people might not, you know? Love it, love it, love it. You know, that's another teachable moment. Um, it shows that from the beginning up until now that you are still standing in your truth right. and you're not apologizing for that. And I think that that, that is so commendable um, to know that about you. Um, now you talked about being an independent artist now. Since you've been on both sides of the spectrum, you were signed to a major label, now you're pursuing um, work or music independently. Which side of the spectrum do you prefer? Well, I mean, the best of both worlds, if you can have the machine of a major label and your independent creativity and freedom, it will be a perfect marriage. But being that you can't, uh, you know, a major label that, you know, you're not gonna get nothing that you put into it. And if, as an independent artist, you have to put a lot of money into marketing. It's, it's a lot of your own money, a lot of time, but you know, like I said, but it's your freedom to do what you want. You're not restricted of, like you said earlier, what they want you to look like, what they want you to sound like, what they want you to put out, what trends they want you to follow, because it's the sound, they want you to sound like everything's on the radio right now, and we'll put millions of dollars behind your project if you do this, and if you sound like this, and if you look like this, you know, like I said, you know, if you, I'm gonna continue to make great music that I like, and you know, everybody that jump on board with me, hey, enjoy the ride. We're gonna have some fun. I'll make good music, so. Nice, nice. Now, speaking of, you know, making good music or great music, I wanna talk, uh, tell you, um, how are you capitalizing off of your music since we are in a pandemic? What advice do you have for other artists on how to monetize their music? Well, me, I'm learning as I go, because like I said, this is a new, a new thing. I don't think everybody was used to going to the studio, you know, I'm used to going to the studio, having an engineer doing this, and, and I had my schedule pretty much set. You know, like I said, when everything came to a screech and hump, I'm like, now what? I don't have my engineer. So what I did is, when the pandi pandi pandemic happened, damn, it sounded like Floyd Mayweather. When the, pan <laughs> <laughs> when the pandemic happened, <laughs> uh, when the pandemic happened, um, I had to learn how to engineer my own project. I had to learn how to almost forget everything I knew about being in the studio with the mixing board and understand I have to now know this new technology that I was running so far from to learn because I just like being creative. Now I have to learn how to engineer, record, do this and do this. All the things I never wanted to learn how to do. Now I'm forced to do it. And that was one of the things I really appreciate about me having to sit down for a second and really realize this is now where you have to operate. This is your space. Figure it out. And I was going from YouTube to phone calls to tutorials. I learned how to engineer, record, and master mix my own project. And I, and I was really proud of that. So Good Times was the first project I did from engineering, recording, writing, uh, doing the beat, doing the music, doing everything all by myself. Mm. First thing, so that, and I, and I tell young, I mean, new artists that feel lost, take time to understand who you are as an artist and, and be creative. Learn how to write. 
learn how to, you know, do certain things that you probably thought you couldn't do. And you know, it, it, it's a good time to just understand who you are and, and learn more about your craft because it's more dimension than just singing and rapping. Yeah, it's way more dimensions. You know, it's, it's far more dimensions than just you know singing and rapping now. I, I love it. You know, once again, you know, just a valuable lesson there. Um, understanding who you are as an artist and figuring it out, evolving, evolving with the times, even if something gets in the way. You know, prior to the pandemic, I was in a studio, you know, doing these interviews. Right. And I'm not going back to a studio yet. So I had to figure this all right. out right. by you myself. Go. You know, yeah. it wasn't like, OK, let me just let you know, these interviews die um, so that I could take it off of the dial and radio syndication. No, I had to figure out everything for myself. So I'm glad that you told people that. Don't get stuck. Don't get, Don't stuck. get stuck. Can't get stuck. Anyway. Can't get stuck. By the way. Huh? I said congratulations, by the way. Oh, Here thank you. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. So can we expect Jodeci to get back together? And if so, when? Uh, I won't even crawl down that rabbit hole. So, I, I mean, you know, we I'm a fan of Jodeci, too. We all are. So, you know, everything's got to be right. When it's right, then that's when you'll see it. I think that it's, it's probably, you know, it's going to be, it's going to happen. You know, it's going to happen. So, we, I can't, you know, I can't let too much go because you got a lot out of me today, which they tell me, <laughs> they tell me I got to go. 20 minutes ago, they're like, all right, time to wrap it up. So. Okay, so, so, so just one more thing. So, you talked about right. the, the Jodeci uh, movie. Uh, will it, what network will it be on? We don't know that yet. We don't know that yet. No, we don't know that yet. Okay, so you're still figuring out the network. So filming hasn't started yet. The only thing that you can tell me is that there will be a Joe to see. Definitely, this story right. definitely will be told. I can definitely tell you that one thousand percent. So, you did you all go to seek out someone picking up your story, or did networks come to you? Um, they came to us. I mean, no. Joe to see. They have. We're, inter we're an interesting group. You know what I'm saying? The story is very interesting. Although you know, like the little. Uh, kibbles and bits I've been giving is far more to the story than what people probably even know. So, and that story needs to be told. You know, I don't mind yeah. talking about the surface things that everybody know, but the, the things that, that need to be told and people are going to probably be, you know, shocked about it in the maze and surprised about it, it's going to be told. So, nice, 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 nice. So, your single Good Times, where can my listeners and my viewers listen to your music and then listen to the remix that's it's dropping on, on, on all platforms? The videos out on Vivo, YouTube, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so yeah, just all platforms, just type in good times, you know, G-O-O-D-T-I-M-E-Z, uh, good times, what is it at the end? So nice. all, all platforms and we good. And keep looking yeah. out for more music. Yes. This, yes. this Friday, the remix comes this Friday. I think the 29th is the day. Yeah, the 29th. Mm -hmm. the 29th the remix, yeah. And one more thing I need you to share, your social media platform so they can follow you. Okay, uh, Mr. Dalvin at Instagram, Dalvin the Great at Facebook, Mr. Dalvin at Twitter. Nice, nice. So, uh, Dalvin, I think I'm following you on on um, Instagram. Can I get a follow back? You better be following me. I've been here with you for an hour and a half. <laughs> this is the longest interview I've been doing with anybody. You we married now. We, we married. <laughs> you ain't following follow me. I'm going to go, go through my phone look for fast tail. I'm going to find you on there. <laughs> Mr. Dalvin, thank you so thank much you. for carving out some time. This it's has been, yes, a pleasure it's and a pleasure. dream come true for me. I wish you nothing but continued success. <laughs> and I, and you I too. will, well. you thank well. you. I'll be looking out for good times as dropping right. the remix this Friday. Take right. care. All right. All right. See you later. Bye bye. So there you have it. Mr. Dalvin of Jodeci. It was great speaking with him. I know that, you know, there were other questions I wanted to ask, but you know, when I have these interviews, I know that a lot of things are personal and I really don't want to get in people's business. That's, and, and paint them in a bad light. Um, I'll leave that up to the biopic <laughs> and hopefully it won't be on Lifetime. <laughs> you know, And I really hope that they do this amazing group Jodeci uh, justice. They deserve it. They really are, and I, I'm not saying were, they are the blueprint for what I believe R&B should be. I love the mag the marriage. I love the fusion of, you know, the soulfulness of the hip hop growing up in New York City. You know, we live on, on hip hop. Um, so just to have that music, I need Joe to see back on the scene. I really do. Make sure that you 
um, follow Mr. Dalvin on his social media platforms as he he mentioned and make sure that you also get his streams up for good times. I don't know if you heard the original song, I have, it's amazing, it's really feel good music. So I'm anticipating the release of Good Times Remix. So I'm just gonna give it up for Mr. Dalvin, amazing, amazing. So at the onset of the show, I asked you to just do me a quick favor or two, if you don't mind, make sure that you subscribe to all Sonya On Air streaming platforms. Sonya On Air is streaming across every major streaming platform. Make sure that you look in the description section of this um, show and purchase you some Sonya On Air and Power merch. Why not let your clothing be the statement? And I also told you about an amazing jewelry line, you know, just in case you don't feel like wearing diamonds for the day, you know, when I finish this show, I'm definitely taking this off because I got to go out there onto the streets. <laughs> if you are born to bling like I am, why don't you visit www.borntoblingjewelry.com and purchase $5 necklaces. The necklaces, the necklaces also come with matching earrings. You know, you just got to coordinate. So once again, be sure to head over to www.borntoblingjewelry.com. That's a tongue teaser. It's a tongue teaser, but the jewelry is absolutely amazing. I thank you so, so much for tuning into another amazing edition of Sign On Air. Not only subscribe and hit the notification button, but make sure you leave a comment and share it with your friends. Share it with your mom and then, okay? <laughs> I love you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, dolls. Smooches. <laughs>